I want to outline what I kind of the intuitive force of this problem. Um, I don't think that this is ultimately just kind of a philosopher's problem. I think this is a, a real problem. Uh, and finally, talk about the five kinds of evidence that Goldman thinks that we can have, that we as novices could have to adjudicate between conflicting expert testimony. Okay, so first thing, trying to really bolster the intuitive force of this problem, I consider our situation with COVID. Um, we have conflicting expert testimony all the time. Just say um, two experts, John and Sally, who they disagree about the infection fatality rate of COVID. One thinks it's 0.18, one thinks it's 0.58, say. And that's the rate at which people die once they're infected with COVID. Okay. Now, they disagree. They're both epidemiologists. Uh, how do we, as novices, adjudicate that dispute? And the real question, here's this is really crucial, not how do we actually do it, but how do we justifiably do it? Of course, there are ways to actually do it. You can flip a coin. You can uh, pick whichever one has the prettier teeth. You can uh, pick whichever one... Um, is of your political persuasion, etc. But the question is how you can come to a justified belief that one of them is right over the other. There are beliefs that you don't have support for and beliefs that you do have good support for. So the question is how do you have good support or how do you have justification in other words for believing that one expert is right over the other? That's the question. And it doesn't it seems hard to answer that question. And here's why, just very briefly. Experts are people who know a lot about the domain. Novices, in Goldman's terms, uh, or people who are non-experts, don't know a lot. The way we would normally distinguish an expert about the domain is saying that person knows a lot. But we as novices are not in a position to know whether someone knows a lot, right? And in particular, or and maybe even more forcibly, uh, even assuming we can justify them knowing a lot about the domain, these two experts, John and Sally, we don't know any way of distinguishing between them. We don't know enough about the domain when they're conflicting, when their evidence or when their testimony is conflicting, to know which of them to trust. Okay, so it seems like uh, we don't, we aren't able to justifiably come to a conclusion about which one to trust. Okay, so Goldman identifies five. He, he doesn't think this is a, uh, an intractable problem. He thinks this is a solvable problem that we actually can um, justifiably believe one expert over the other, at least a lot of times. Maybe sometimes we can't, but sometimes we can. And what I'm going to do is instead of going through his whole argument, I'm just going to talk through the five kinds of evidence he thinks we can have for trusting one expert over another. And the first is we can listen to the arguments they give. Uh, so John might tell you, well, look, uh, this is my argument for thinking it's 0.18. And Sally can tell you, well, let, let me give you my argument for thinking it's 0.58. You can compare their arguments, see which one is better. Um, and sometimes they can even give you arguments for why they think their opponent is mistaken. Now, this kind of evidence only goes so far because so many times we can't understand the arguments because we're not experts, right? How many of us are going to understand an argument between epidemiologists, right? Think about quantum physics, different different interpretations of quantum physics. Who is going to even understand the argument, right? Who even understands the terms, right? Who even understands what quantum physics is? Not very many people. The second kind of evidence is um, you could appeal to other experts, right? So it might be that while these two experts disagree, other experts, in fact the vast majority of them, agree with Sally over John. So that's another kind of evidence you could have. Um, you could appeal again to meta-experts, right? So these are people who are expertise, who have expertise about who counts as an expert. Um, now, so this would be someone who uh, 
has knowledge of the way epidemiology credentialing or education works. And so they're able to say, look, John is more of an expert than Sally. You should listen to him over her. Now again, you might be wondering, well, wait a second, what happens when the meta experts disagree? So again, this isn't going to solve every case. Um, in fact, there's nothing keeping us from saying, well, some people are going to disagree about which are the better credentialing institutions, right? Um, apparently, there are these sorts of people who fight between different Ivy League schools about which one is better. Um, I know only by testimony and not by experience. So again, uh, there's nothing that staves off the fundamental problem here. And in many cases, we won't have credible meta experts anyway. So that's the, but that's the third kind, and maybe sometimes we have access to that kind of evidence. Um, and fourth, uh, and I should note here that this is going to line up with a lot of the things y'all came up with in the live session, um, especially these last three. So I just talked about the third, so that's one that one of the groups came up with. Fourth, um, Goldman talks about uh, evidence of interests or biases that could undermine an expert's opinion about a matter of fact. And y'all talked about this. A lot of people pointed out, uh, I think Grant was talking about the WHO and how um, a lot of people are worried about the sort of bias towards um, the Chinese state that the WHO might have. Again, I'm not here to settle that question. I'm here to say if that were true, if the WHO, for example, were, did have a bias uh, in favor of the Chinese state uh, and the CDC didn't, then when they disagree, maybe you have a reason to trust the CDC over the WHO. So what counts as a bias? That's a hard question, right? So in the WHO case, it seems to be that their opinion is in some cases going to be determined by, or at least strongly influenced by, what the state, the Chinese state, uh, thinks or wants them to say, but rather, and what we need in addition for it to be a true bias is for what the Chinese state wants them to say is not influenced or not strongly influenced by the truth. It's not truth tracking, right? Because it, it wouldn't count as a bias just to say that the Chinese state is influencing the WHO's opinion if it turned out that the Chinese state was really good at figuring out stuff about epidemiology and they had lots of true opinions, and that's why they were trying to influence the WHO, right? But what we think is a bias is when there's an influence that is not what we call truth tracking. It's not sort of interested in the truth. So if the Chinese state is telling the WHO to say something, and it's not because it's true, then that's not going to be a truth tracking influence, right? It's going to be uh, very unlikely, in other words, that something is true just when the Chinese state says to believe it. So that's what we think is a bias. So when um, an influence that is not truth tracking, right, or not truth conducive, or in maybe the simplest terms, uh, an influence that uh, has no correlation with the truth. And so that could undermine one expert over another. Finally, you could look at past track records and uh, I remember one of the groups in the um, live session talked about this. You could go and look and see, well, how often has the CDC been right about matters of epidemiology and how often has the WHO been right about matters of epidemiology? And sometimes this is objectively verifiable, right? You can go out and say like, oh, well, this group or this expert predicted this, this one predicted this, and then we were able to see. This won't always be possible right? Sometimes um, you can't go and see what the results are and get in that way independent confirmation of uh, past track records, right? So if that were possible, then we could have decided between these different interpretations of quantum mechanics by now, right? But they're both consistent with all the evidence, uh, or at least minimally consistent. So in some cases of disagreement with, between experts, we won't have that. Okay, so these are five ways. We don't need to work through uh, how they apply in all the different cases. But what, it can't, what seems to be emerging as a pattern is this. I've shown in some of the cases how, like, look, in so many of these cases, it, we 
can conceive in some cases of having this sort of evidence that would help us distinguish between the two experts. And in a way that wouldn't require us to be experts, right? We could have each of these five kinds of evidence without ourselves becoming experts. And that's what Goldman is really interested in. If you're going to stay a novice, right, a non-expert, how do you distinguish, uh, how do you justifiably pick an expert to trust when they disagree? But here's the other thing. With each of these, it seems like there are going to be cases where it's not going to help us. And so it stands to reason, I think, that there will be some cases, and if we were really interested in it, we could concoct such a case where none of these five kinds of evidence is going to be available to us, or at least not, um, we won't be able to be justified in um, relying on it. And so there may be cases where we cannot justifiably pick between experts when they disagree. Now, is that such a bad thing? Um, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like that's just going to be the case. That seems we don't get mired in some sort of like lack of all total knowledge. What we've seen is that there are going to be tons of cases where we can pick between disagreeing experts justifiably, and at least some cases where we can't. Um, and so it's sort of a mixed bag there. And that's sort of uh, going to be Goldman's ultimate conclusion. And uh, it doesn't seem all that Bad. The bad conclusion, he thinks, is if we had to conclude that we can never trust experts when they disagree. That'd be really bad because in so many domains, experts are always disagreeing about basically everything, right? Of course, part of that depends on how you define, how you decide who's an expert in a domain. Uh, and that goes back to our first video.